Imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery, but fake goods are costing manufacturers billions in lost sales. A UN report says the black market in counterfeit products has become as profitable as the illegal drug trade. But what's at the heart of the problem? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazm Seeker. The United Nations has released its first ever study on organized crime in the Asia Pacific region. The UN's Office on Drugs and Crime says rapid economic growth has given rise to vast criminal networks profiting from illegal trade in goods and people. And it's big business. Overall, the UN agency estimates the illicit trade is worth around $90 billion a year. To give you an idea, that's twice the size of Myanmar's gross domestic product and eight times the economic output of Cambodia. Drug trafficking still generates the most money, heroin and methamphetamine alone earning criminal gangs more than $30 billion. But counterfeiting is almost as profitable. The trade in fake designer handbags and T-shirts heading to the US and Europe and fake pharmaceuticals is worth more than $29 billion. Another area of concern is unauthorized logging, a $17 billion business. The biggest customers are the US, Europe, and the Middle East. Most of it is processed in China, but much of the illegal trade in logging can be traced back to Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, and Cambodia. And let's bring in our guests now to talk more about this in Bangkok. Giovanni Broussard. Giovanni is from the UN office on drugs and crime, which produced this report. And joining us via Skype from Durham in the UK is David Wall, a professor of criminology at Durham University. And in our London studios, Atar Hussein, director of the Asia Research Center at the London School of Economics. Giovanni Broussard, if I could start with you, uh, just talk us through uh, uh, the extent of, of this problem as, as you see it and, and as has been um, put out in this uh, UN report. Certainly. Hello, and first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, the report that the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime is launching today is a report that tells a story of uh, uh, the extent of transnational organized crime in this region. It's a story that is quite alarming. Uh, as uh, you correctly said, uh, we have calculated that the total value of financial flows generated by uh, criminal activities is worth 90 billion, nine zero, uh, billion dollars uh, a year. But there are two-thirds of uh, the financial value of criminal activities that are clear indication that uh, there is a diversification of uh, criminal activities in this region. Uh, as you uh, already described, some of these activities are uh, the counterfeiting of goods, uh, inclu including uh, fraudulent medicines, but also uh, what we can uh, call as environmental crimes, start from the um, uh, movements, illegal movements of uh, timber, uh, a parallel um, market existing uh, on, the, on the side of the legitimate uh, market of uh, timber. But then we have also illegal trades of uh, wildlife, which is now increasingly getting connected to other parts of the world, especially uh, Africa. Uh, we have uh, electronic wastes that are dumped in this region from uh, uh, other parts of the world, specifically uh, Europe and uh, the United States. And we have uh, also hazardous substances, in particular ozone depleting substances, that are being still produced and traded in this region. We have a, a uh, significant concern for the extent of uh, uh, human trafficking and smuggling of migrants in this region. Some of the most egregious violations of human rights are uh, the results of uh, human trafficking uh, from this region to the rest of the world or even within this region. The same applies for the smuggling of migrants where Asian migrants are smuggled uh, to Australia, to Europe, to Canada, to the US, uh, through criminal networks that take advantage of the position of vulnerability of uh, people in this region. Right. The result is that there is a huge um, 
Yes. Okay. Well, you, you, you certainly document uh, a, a number of uh, things there, but um, there is, of course, uh, another side to all of this, which has also uh, been documented in another report, and we're going to highlight some of that now, because it stands to reason that if uh, nobody was buying counterfeit goods, there wouldn't be a market for them. Uh, but people are especially look like uh, luxury brands, and an EU-funded report in 2010 explains why. It says consumers benefit from the market for knockoff goods at knockdown down prices. It says losses to the makers of designer brands are vastly exaggerated, as most of those who buy fakes would never purchase the real thing. It disputes the claims that the counterfeiting of luxury brands funds organized crime. And it says, if anything, buying fakes actually serves to promote the genuine product. Uh, David Ward, if I could turn to, to you then, I know you probably echo uh, some of the points that have just uh, been made there. Um, just Explain, expand on that if you can, and explain why uh, you believe that the, the counterfeit goods industry is not um, as bad as some people are making out. Um, um, yes, I, I, I do agree with the report, and I think it's a, a you know does a very valuable service to society. Um, I, I guess my um, it's a critique really of a certain part of. Um, the counterfeiting, um, anti-counterfeiting uh, strategy, and, and and this is really because uh, um, my my primary interest is in making sure that sort of public resources go into the right place, and so first of all, I, I think it's very very important to to dis to disaggregate, to split safety critical goods, aircraft parts, um, um, pharmaceuticals, the stuff that kills us, the stuff that if we consume it it will do us damage. And that includes sort of environmental um, crimes, um, the logging industries, the parallel uh, trades. So I, I was splitting those from the non-safety critical goods, which I, I, I looked at the counterfeiting of luxury goods. And what we found there was a very interesting scenario. And it was, I mean, the question all the time is whether we should be putting public resources into policing this or whether the, um, the the owners of the intellectual property should be funding this themselves. And, you know, getting into this piece of research, uh, and this was a, 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 a piece of research which came out of the, um, the EU funded study. Um, and we found that, that with the, um, the non-safety critical counterfeit goods, most people knew exactly what they were buying. And this ran counter to the conventional argument, the arguments which were put to us uh, by OECD and the and UN UNDOC. Um, uh, so in the terms of the remit of the question that I was asked, um, uh, which was where we should put the public resource, well, you know, if people have, know what they're buying, they are not being harmed. And in that sense, we should be focusing on the sort of the, the, the small number of that group who have paid, say, full price for a, a Rolex. The, the group of people who, for whom um, the, to buy the products will actually damage the market. The other group, the, the, the majority of people who buy these cheap uh, knockoffs, um, they are not, they're not threatening the market at all. And when you start to look into it in further details, you actually find that they actually create desire for the for the broader product. And this is this was the thing that uh, shocked me. Let's get the view then from uh, Atar Hussein. What is your uh, take on this, uh, on the, 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 uh, the um, economy and these uh, counterfeit goods? Uh, are they a harmless bargain or a costly mistake? I think we have to take a measured approach. It depends on which good is counterfeited and how much. For example, counterfeiting of medicine, it can be extremely dangerous and harmful process and certain other luxury goods, I think that, okay, the manufacturer is hurt, but it's not clear that public interest is as badly damaged as that of the interest of the particular producers. Second thing is that the tenuous, the, the link between sweatshop factories and counterfeit goods is a tenuous one. If uh, uh, sweatshops are used for producing all that? kinds of goods, in what, fact- What makes you say that there isn't much of a, a link there? No, let, let me finish, because sweatshops, if they, they exist, are used to produce a wide variety of goods. In most cases, they pr produce perfectly legitimate goods. 
if we are concerned with sweatshops, we should deal directly with the sweatshop problem rather than via counterfeit goods. Giovanni uh, Broussard, what, what evidence um, can your group produce that, that there is a, a direct link here between the trade in, in, some, in these counterfeit goods and the link to organized crime? Well, the link, let's, let's put the link in this way. Uh, these factories uh, that produce counterfeit goods um, operate very often in a regime of, uh, um, in a clandestine uh, regime, uh, with a complete disrespect of labor regulations. In this situation, uh, the workers in these factories are very often people that are vulnerable, especially migrants or victims of human trafficking. Now, looking at the issue of of counterfeit goods is another way of looking at the possibility of generating uh, other forms of crimes. Uh, the point that we are trying to make uh, in this report is that crimes often do not generate themselves in isolation, are sometimes linked with each other. It's not often an organic uh, linkage, sometimes is uh, um, uh, occasional uh, linkage between different flows, but there is a reason for concern, especially uh, from the supply side of counterfeit goods. The effects uh, a destination in the market, I would tend to agree with what David has just said. Uh, the economics of uh, the counterfeit groups, of the counterfeit goods in the destination market may or may not have detrimental effects. Uh, but we are looking at this issue not from an economic point of view, more from a security point of view. And having this amount of uh, uh, resources being channeled through uh, organizations, um, legitimate or semi-legitimate, that can take advantage of the big profits to utilize probably also uh, child labor and uh, uh, smuggled migrant is certainly a reason for concern in this region. Yeah, I want to put that some of that back to uh, David in, in, in just a moment, but I, I, I want to ask you as well, Giovanni, about um, uh, one of the things that, that this report calls for is more, more cross-border cooperation uh, between the, the countries that, are, that are, are seeing some of this going on. That's, that's easy to say, but it's very difficult to implement, isn't it? Especially when you're talking about so many uh, different countries across uh, such, a la such a vast area of land. What, what specifically can be done to strengthen it? Well, it's easy to say, and actually, unfortunately, there is no plan B. There has to be uh, more cooperation across the border between countries. Uh, we are uh, talking about criminal networks. Uh, they are dynamic. They move quite efficiently. Uh, they don't respect, really, borders or jurisdiction, where the law enforcement uh, community and governments do have a limitation represented by their own borders uh, and jurisdiction. Uh, we've been uh, um, using for the past few years quite extensively uh, a United Nations Conventions, the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, which um, supports the uh, use of international uh, tools for cooperation, from mutual legal assistance to extradition to also a more modern form of investigations like anti-money laundering and anti-corruption measures. We essentially need to look at these uh, uh, crimes First of all, or to the um, to dismantling these uh, organized groups, first by strengthening um, the criminal justice system at national level. We need to put definitely more resources in the law enforcement, have a more effective and independent judiciary, um, which. Uh, can uh, ensure stronger convictions. But we also have to make sure that this criminal justice system do not work in isolation from the neighboring countries and from the regional uh, and global um, scenario. Now, some signs of improvements uh, can be seen already. Uh, we talk in some of these chapters about some specific flows where um, where some forms of cooperation between countries is developing. Um, this is probably a good sign, and it's uh, something that needs more support. Uh, we are calling for various international organizations, and certainly uh, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is ready to assist countries to strengthen even more their capacities to link with the neighbors.
David Wall, I want to put the point to you that, that uh, Giovanni made earlier about the, the, the sweatshop factories and their involvement uh, in this. A lot of these uh, factories, many of them uh, in Asia, uh, where workers are working under very low pay, difficult conditions, long hours, are also are producing some of these counterfeit goods. I mean, when we hear about this stuff, we often hear about the big, the big brand names uh, that are, are, are somehow connected to this. But it, the, the, the illegitimate side of the, the counterfeit side uh, of, of the economy uh, is also involved in this. Um, yes, uh, I think that, um, that goes without saying. Um, uh, my own study, um, as Giovanni rightly pointed out, was you know, particularly linked, it was a, almost a, um, a theoretical um, look at um, domestic sort of end user markets. And if we, uh, and I guess my central argument is that we don't know enough about the micro dynamics of the whole counterfeiting process in order to develop an anti counterfeiting um, uh, strategy. Um, and that we need to know more about these, um, uh, these the sweatshops, the whole sweatshop movement. Um, um, but, but what we're not getting is this sort of in-depth research, which allows us to go right deep into the, the counterfeiting process to, to identify these. We need, you know, the hard evidence, um, the evidence trail, um, so that we can understand it. Because I think that, that some of the outer counterfeiting um, strategies, the sort of shock and awe, have actually worn a bit thin with the, with the general public because I don't approve of uh, counterfeits. Um, I, I, I actually just don't like them, to be quite honest. I much prefer some of the, the originals. Um, and, um, you know, I think unless we do this sort of in-depth research and we understand the microdynamics of, of the process, who, who commissions a project? Who designs it? I mean, it must take an awful lot of skills. There's a, a skill trail there. Um, who, who actually... Someone must create, a, write a contract with the manufacturer. Um, it's a, it's a very intense process, and we know very little about the whole thing. And yet, we're making these broad assumptions. And right. I would appeal to Undoc to to actually commission. All right. Well, let's uh, expand on this a little bit. Uh, and and uh, we mentioned uh, how uh, how much uh, China and, and other Asian countries are uh, involved in this. China is central uh, to the trade in fake goods. Uh, and uh, this gives us some idea now. Customs officers in the United States say 87% of counterfeits seized there between 2008 and 2010 originated in China. And European Customs puts their figure at around 74%. It's something Chinese authorities are aware of. A nationwide crackdown last year involving 18,000 officers seized $182 million worth of counterfeits. 2,000 people were arrested. Rob McBride has more on that now from Hong Kong. This assessment really illustrates the growth of the counterfeiting industry in recent times, saying that three quarters of all counterfeit goods seized in recent years have originated from East Asia and from China in particular. It uh, also points to the corrosive influences of the illicit trade in undermining rule of law, in helping breed corruption and so on. It has to be said that the Chinese authorities have been clamping down hard on copyright pirates and on the counterfeiters, but the message still still hasn't gotten through to the lower levels, to local officials and indeed to many traders themselves who would say, well, it's just business, what's the harm? Uh, obviously, when it comes to the counterfeiting of baby milk formula or to uh, fake uh, pharmaceuticals, then the harm potentially is obvious. And again, the assessment points to China and India as being the main sources of those fake drugs. Most of those things, sadly, find their way to the poorer countries of Africa and Southeast Asia. People with less money buying what they hope are remedies, in fact, often making their conditions worse. And indeed, this assessment points to a sampling of anti-malarial drugs in Southeast Asia that found that nearly 50% of them were indeed fakes. Rob McBride for Inside Story, Hong Kong. Ajitar Hussain, if I could turn back to you then, um, clearly there is a perception that China uh, is not doing enough uh, to combat this problem. What do you believe they, they, they should be doing? I think that it's not surprising that China is the main source of counterfeit goods. China is the, is the factory of the world, the biggest manufacturer. In fact, many of the luxury goods which are counterfeited are also made in China. So that doesn't surprise me. And so it's not particularly... The second question we should keep in mind is that historically 
some countries where sources are counterfeit good. I can name South Korea and Taiwan before, but they're no longer so important. The question to ask, what, what led to the change in their attitude? When the countries co in question themselves have intellectual property rights to protect, they become much keener to protect international pr property rights. And I think that China will, f will follow the same route. When the Chinese have more intellectual property of their own to protect, they will also become much more, m much more severe in protecting other people's pr property rights. Do you see that happening um, anytime soon, that the, the Chinese will be producing more of their own goods? I think there is a change in attitude in China. I mean, obviously, the problem is a big one, but it would be wrong to say that there has been no change in China. There has been change. And, for example, Chinese producers themselves are actually agitating for tightening up intellectual property rights in China. Uh, what so is DVD the films? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, counterfeit DVD films hurts Western producers, but also hurts Chinese producers. But I'm interested to know from you, uh, Atar Hussain, what, what, what is the cost uh, to society uh, as a whole in all of this, uh, not just financially, but socially as well? I think it well. varies depending on which, which good is being counterfeited. Counterfeit drugs, medicines, baby formula milk, extremely harmful. But counterfeit luxury goods like Louis Vuitton bags, I don't think uh, carries that much social harm. Giovanni Broussard, I want to put the point that uh, uh, Atar Hussein uh, just mentioned there earlier about uh, China is only going to be um, invested in this if they start producing goods uh, of their own, because that's when the incentive uh, kicks in. What's your view on that? Well, my view is that actually China at the moment is called upon a monumental challenge in uh, most of the flows that we are analyzing. And if you allow me, I will uh, move away for a second from the issue of uh, counterfeit goods. China is uh, called upon the challenge of uh, uh, tracking down uh, most of the criminal flows that take place in this region be it because China is the most populated, the biggest country in the region uh, and has been growing at unprecedented pace uh, over the past few years. Uh, China in this moment and the law enforcement and the criminal justice system in China is called upon, upon cracking down um, essentially uh, every form of uh, um, transnational organized crime that we have been seeing. Um, the wealth of, uh, uh, of the Chinese consumer is another driver for some of uh, uh, these illegal activities. Now, we have talking about the uh, goods being, uh, the counterfeit goods uh, being bought for finding cheaper uh, alternatives to uh, high valuable brands. But we have to also take in consideration that other forms of crimes are not driven by uh, limited capacity, limited resources, but quite the opposite. Wealth is actually generating, um, like in a kind of Hoover effect, uh, a movement of goods towards uh, the uh, rich economy in uh, in this region. Uh, China is not the only rich economy in this region. Thailand, Vietnam are other, uh, other uh, rich economies, and they are all called upon the uh, challenge of identifying uh, goods that most of the times are not produced uh, or are not generated in their country. They have to educate their um, citizens to understand the consequences of purchasing illegal goods, and they have to ensure uh, prosecution for the offenders. So it's actually a quite impressive challenge that they are called upon. And in fact, this report is not aiming at all at pointing the finger against any country. On the opposite, we are trying uh, to propose the fact that by working together probably will be easier to tackle these problems. All right. And on that note, we will uh, leave it. Uh, I want to thank uh, all three of our guests. Giovanni Broussard in Bangkok, uh, David Wall in Durham, and Atar Hussein in London. Thanks very much for your time, gentlemen. And thank you for joining us. Don't forget, you can find this program and many more 
at aljazeera.com. Just follow the links for programs on the website and then Inside Story, and you can leave us your comments there as well. I'm Hazem Seeker. The latest news is up next. Bye for now.